Alright, so let's talk about school safety. Zero tolerance, we were mentioning that a little bit ago, I think some of y'all talked about that as we were having some discussion. It's a policy that mandates predetermined consequences of punishment for specific offenses regardless of the circumstances. This came about really, I, I would say probably um, maybe in the 80s or 90s when that really became popular because what was happening, some parents felt like that, well, you're being unfair and very inconsistent. If it's a rich kid or a popular kid, they get one punishment. If it's a kid that is free or reduced lunch or not very popular or you know, some of that, then they get the book thrown out of them. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not fair. What you ought to do is that we don't care who the student is, if there's an infraction, they ought to get the same punishment. And when I think you we were talking to the example that one of you gave is, hey, what if I had to, my car can't crank, so I borrow my brother's car, I drive to school, I find out that uh, he has a gun or a knife in the trunk, and somehow the school finds out about it, and it, it, is it fair for me to get in, in trouble? Well, what I would tell you with zero policy, we can't decide that Mike didn't know about it, and so we ought to let him go, but yet Wayne, even though he tells us the same story, we know he lies, and he probably <laughs> brought that gun to school because he was going to use it at some point in time, so we expel him. So that's kind of the zero policy, is that we can't treat one one way and one another. If it happens, it happens. And um, the courts will uphold your zero tolerance policy. If that is your policy, the courts will uphold it. Now, uh, just to give you a little example though how it can get out of hand when you don't use common sense. At kindergarten, student was playing at recess and said, I'm going to shoot you. Well, they had a zero policy of threatening students. And so the kindergarten student was expelled. Now folks, I won't say schools, but I'm not sure a <laughs> kindergarten Student, and maybe I don't live in the real world anymore, playing at a recess and using a finger to point is that threatening. And uh, so I think my personal opinion is I'm not in favor of zero policy for, for a couple reasons. One, as an administrator or teacher, you've received training and you need to use some common sense and look at the circumstances. Yes, that does make you make some decisions maybe that doesn't seem fair to Wayne, but maybe the mic likes, and I know that that's part of it, but I do think that makes a lot more sense to make some decisions based on your training, your knowledge, the environment that you're trying to establish at a school. Because one child may bring a butter knife in their lunchbox, and some people consider that a weapon, where others may bring a, a, a dagger. You know, and I personally, that's a little, <laughs> bit, a little bit different uh, uh, on that. And the other thing, is that there are many, naturally there are many more suspensions and expulsions when you have a zero tolerance policy. And I am I'm really in favor of trying to keep kids in school up to a certain point, but there are some that don't need to be in school or not, not in a regular school setting, anyhow, I'll say it that way. All right, and then we had uh, Butler versus Rio, and it, that may have been in the book as well, where a student took his brother's car to school and he was expelled because there was a weapon in the car or maybe it was drug school, I don't remember exactly. All right, weapons. The thing you do need to know is that with the Georgia law 20-2-1184, reporting has changed and right now, if you have a weapon on campus, it is a felony and folks, that's one time you don't have a choice. You have to report that to law enforcement. Now. What is a weapon? Is it a knife, one and a half inch blade, or is it one with four inches blade? You know, you need to define in your student handbook what is a weapon, because you do have some flexibility there. You certainly can't violate the law and say, well, we don't think a gun's uh, a weapon if it doesn't have bullets. Well, you know, I don't think you have that type of choice there, but you do have some choice of what you can define as weapons. Some people would say nut chucks and all things of that sort, or, or weapons. So it should be somewhere in your student handbook about what the weapon is. 
And like I said, firearms are dangerous weapons, must be reported to law enforcement. That is not a choice for uh, school officials because when they establish a law, you're supposed to follow it. If you remember the code of conduct, or code of ethics, uh, standard one is your legal compliance. And if it's a law, then you should report it. All right, uh, use of weapon with assault, and you should define weapon in the student handbook as a total. My suggestion is every year, the principal or superintendent or somebody, and I think it'd probably be better, particularly like a Gwinnett, where you have all kinds of townships and, and attendance zones, to sit down with the local police department and kind of review the policy and make sure you're on the same page. You, there's other things you can talk about. How about if a police officer wants to talk with a student? How about if there's a problem and they want to interview a student with something? You know, they may not want to go to the house and interview because it could be something that they have a concern about the parents. So you just need to make sure that every year you sit down with local law enforcement and understand that particularly as a new principal, a new assistant principal, or a new chief of police, it's great to sit down and have those discussions before the fact, not after the fact. Student victimization, bullying, intimidation, sexual harassment, dating violence, sexting, cyberbullying, all of that falls under school safety. And let me tell you, if you don't think sexting is um, serious now, if you're in a middle school, I guarantee you that 60% of the kids probably have received some type of um, text, email, photo, that is sexting. It may be asking about something or it may be sending a photo. I think it's probably more prevalent in the middle school than the high school because as you get to the high school you have a little, not a lot more sense, but a little more sense <laughs> and uh, can probably get around. But really the middle school, they have more pressure on them. They really do. It's a lot more peer pressure at the middle school than high school. Joan? Um, and it's seeping down to elementary too. Absolutely. Well, how many kids have phones now with the middle school? I mean uh, elementary. Yeah, yeah. It's older siblings are showing in their in class and you know with Instagram, Snapchat and all that behind the scenes they're sending each other stuff so it, it's it's ramping up too. We had um, um, a ethics symposium yesterday and today that's why I was making that. I told you I may not make it. And one of our investigators in his project that he did a lot with social media and I thought it was great. He called Snapchat evil because it is one that, you know, after 30 seconds, it goes away. Now, there are some forensic people that can recover and do that, but it is much more difficult. And uh, in his opinion, the teachers should not use Snapchat for anything with students, or, you know, he just calls it an evil. I thought it was good. I don't allow my kids Snapchat because there's no way to monitor it. It's yeah. awful. Exactly. Yeah. Social media, cell phones, blogs, Facebook. Kids don't use Facebook anymore. That's for adults. You know, we, we're, we're behind times. You know, they use all kinds of other things. Sexual harassment is unwanted or unwelcome behavior. And of course, there's two types of harassment, quid pro quo and hostile environment. And we'll talk about that. Quid pro quo is this or that. In other words, if you do this, I'll do that. In other words, you're kind of trading off. If you do this, I'll do that. And then the other is a hostile environment where sexual harassment becomes so severe, persistent, or pervasive it affects the student's ability to participate in or benefit from a program activity. It could also be you, but the bottom line, it's hard to say it's a hostile environment if you've never reported it. Or if you don't say something, particularly if I'm a teacher and I feel very uncomfortable because a principal or another teacher is maybe telling off-color jokes or things of that sort to me. If I kind of laugh with the crowd because I don't want anybody to think that I'm a prude, then I'm really, I'm not so sure I can produce a sexual environment. If I say, Patrick, I don't want to hear that, that's filthy and don't do any more around me, then I've kind of set him on notice that that's it. And I might even want at that time to go to the person and say, you know, I know Patrick maybe didn't mean it, but I was really offended with what he said. I want to let you know that I have said something to the Patrick that I don't speak anymore. And if it happens again, I do want something done. Okay. All right, so we'll start first of all with bullying. And I, I, I really kind of like to pick on the legislators with this. I mean, they don't have any choice because when an issue comes, they pretty much are expected to address it. And because parents, people expect when there's problems, we need to have laws. But here's what I'll tell you, in my opinion, 
just because you have a law about bullying, it doesn't make it where kids stop. I mean, we know that. In fact, all it does sometimes is make it more difficult for you to deal with the issue because everybody has their own definition of bullying and everybody thinks that, well, if, if, if you put a punishment out there, it'll stop. And, you know, if that was the case, we just write, write a note and say, we don't want anybody to be overweight. We don't want anybody to be out of shape. We don't want anybody to be poor. You know, we'll just settle all of that and then it solves all the problems, right? All right, 20-2-751.4, and it became effective May 13th of 2011. It's an act which occurs on school property, on school vehicles, at designated bus stops, at a school-related function, or by use of data or software that is accessed through electronic technology of a local school system. So what they're doing is kind of a, a fine that if it occurs on school property, on a school vehicle, which is what? A bus. A bus. A bus. All right, I can go even a step further that if you're at a designated bus stop, that is considered still part of school that's where the kids meet to go. But you have to have that designated as an official stop. If you've got that on your bus as an official stop, then it covers that as well. Of course, school-related functions, whether it be off campus or on campus. If you've got a senior prom and you don't have it at your school, but you have it at some hotel ballroom, then that would still be considered a school function and uh, your access. And then if you're using school district equipment, software, whatever, that doesn't prevent the Keisha from going home using her own computer and bullying a student. We are getting a little bit better about that now simply because of the problems it causes that carries over to the school, but it still is one that is iffy, depends on the facts. And a definition is any willful attempt or threat to inflict injury on another person when accompanied by the apparent ability to do so. Now, some people would say, if I were five foot two and I wanted to threaten the, the football uh, team, um, uh, you know, the, the star defensive tackle, he's 6'7", 275 pounds, then I may not have the apparent ability to do so. But the bottom line, I may have a gun that would uh, solve the problem. So, anyhow. I have, I have a quick question. So okay. let's say if Keisha does go home and sends ugly things to someone on her own computer, or let's say we're in high school, we we're in high school, let's say I work at the local subway. She comes on my job and she is ugly to me, nasty to me, whatever. And so I go to school the next day and we're in the same three, four classes. Her presence makes me feel uncomfortable. Does that still, even though she's not necessarily bullying me on school property, school grounds and whatnot, but it's carrying over into the school. Would that still? Well, it, you know, I'll answer like any good attorney would. It depends <laughs> on all the facts and things of that sort. Um, if Kakisha would say, oh, I haven't touched her at school, I haven't done anything, but you feel unsafe, it may be that it's just that, well, that's a problem we've got to deal with because at school, we're going to, quote, protect you. Now, we all know that I can't protect you the whole time you're in school if a student wants to get something done. I, mean, I don't mean that in an ugly way, mm -hmm. but bottom line is if Kakisha wants to beat you up, and she wants to do it at school, she, she may have to wait six or seven days or six weeks to pick her time when we let our guard down. So I mean, it, it can, but we are getting better about if we feel things are being carried over, particularly in the hood, the neighborhoods, you know, the, um, during the weekends, if there's a big brouhaha and it's been carried over to the school, we probably as a school system, if we could show that there was some type of maybe imminent danger or possible danger. We could probably, maybe two weeks ago there was another one and we had a big fist fight at school. That would certainly enhance our chances of being able to deal with it when it's off campus as well. All right, now, any intentional display of force such as would give the victim reason to fear or expect immediate body harm, any intentional written, verbal, or physical act which a reasonable person would perceive as being intended to threaten cause another person substantial harm. All this is in the law trying to define what bullying is and substantially disrupts the orderly operation of the school. Now, 
Each local board of education shall adopt a policy that prohibits bullying and shall be included in the student code of conduct. If you put it in the student code of conduct, then it'll never happen because everybody knows it's, uh, it's illegal, right? But anyhow, you have to have it in there. And upon the finding that a student in grades 6 through 12 has committed the offense for the third time in a school year, such student must be assigned or shall be assigned to an alternative school. Now, they've kind of relaxed that a little bit because if you think about some of these rural areas, how in the world, what are, they probably only have one alternative school. It's really, you want to actually put a sixth grader in with a 12th grader? And, and let that 12th grader teach the kid how to do things. I mean, so they kind of relax that some, and you, they can really maybe even call it now uh, an alternative setting. Mm -hmm. Because if I wanted uh, Chris, if I thought maybe he was a bully, I could move him to the far corner and separate everybody else. And that would be an alternative setting that I could say meets the letter of this law now or that I could move Mike up here so that he's very close to me, then that would be an alternative setting. Or maybe I put a, um, a kind of a cardboard, you know how you do a fence almost or a box to separate them where they can't see anybody else? Again, that would be something you, that would probably fit that. And a policy must establish a method for contacting the parent of the bullying and the victim of the bullying. I understand that, but that creates problems too as an administrator. I'm going to use Kakisha and Jonah because they were just talking about something that happened in the neighborhood. And it's carried over to school now. And so Jonah comes to me as principal and says that Kakisha is still threatening me and glaring at me at school. She hadn't done anything yet, but she's threatened me at, you know, in the neighborhood. She's threatened me at school. I'm afraid. And so what I do as required, I pick up the phone and I call Kakisha's parents and say, your daughter is bullying Jonah. Well, what do you think Kakisha's parents going to say? No, she's not. Exactly. They're going to say, no, she's not. You all see what Jonah does in the neighborhood all that. No wonder they do it. <laughs> How many parents jump up there and say, yeah, my child's a bully? Yeah. No, they're going to blame it on the other child and say their child's being bullied. So it really makes it difficult for the administrator when they call because some parents aren't going to accept their sweet little child being a bully. And they're going to certainly blame it on the other students. So, you know, I'll tell you, as an administrator, you can't win sometimes, but yeah. you are required. And I also have to call Jonah's parents and say, Jonah is being bullied at school by Kakeshi and we're trying to handle it, you know, so, because uh, that's what the law requires. Now, teacher responsibilities. Any teacher or other school employee who has reliable information that would lead a person to suspect someone is a target of bullying shall immediately report it to the school principal. Now, folks, and I'm going to pick on the elementary for a few minutes because we started in kindergarten and it goes all the way through 12th grade. Little Susie comes running into the school and after recess and tells uh, Ms. Bowman that Johnny's picking on me. He's just bothering me at recess. The first thing Jonah's going to say, excuse me, Bowman's going to say is, I don't want to hear it. Go sit down. I don't want to hear any tattling. And that's what we tell kids. We don't tattle. And we do that all through grade 12. But now we're trying to change and tell kids, you got to tell us when, when school's not safe. But I mean, really, we are guilty of, particularly when Susie comes in for the fourth day in a row and <laughs> wants to talk about Johnny bullying her. And so we learned it. But I will tell you, you probably need to address it in some type of way. You might want to write down in your little notebook that Susie claimed Johnny was bothering her on uh, August the 28th. And that I spoke with Johnny about it. Johnny may deny it. Or he may say, yes, ma'am, well, I wasn't doing anything. At least you addressed it. You didn't show indifference. And we'll talk about that at some point in time as well. But it says report to the principal. But you know, teachers are not going to report every little tiny answer because they're trying to maintain class. And they can, most of the time they can handle it. And once Susie's back in the classroom, you can probably watch and make sure that everything's OK. And an educator who reports an incident in good faith shall be immune from civil liability. In other words, when I call that parent and say Kakesha is a bully, uh, the parent can't sue me for defamation of character because in good faith I am dealing with this issue. All right, administration. 
policy that includes a statement prohibiting bullying, you need to make this clear, we don't have bullying in school. Each school should have a procedure for the school administration to promptly investigate to determine if bullying took place. An age-appropriate range of consequences, which shall include disciplinary action or counseling, you know, maybe a second grader, maybe counseling. High school kid, like uh, Bajani, or the one that, what was the guy's name that did the attacking? Um, you remember? Bagley? Bagley, yes. Bagley, yeah. Uh, maybe, you know, we, we ought to have something more severe for Bagley because he has a history of it. Mm -hmm. right. jail? <laughs> and then a process to report bullying anonymously. They will tell you, and I, by they I mean experts will tell you that that is one of the best ways to find out about things is to have an anonymous tip that's supposed to help if you're committing fraud in the school, whether it's teachers you know stealing things or whether it's kids bullying. Now of course you go get some kids that'll just go make up something and put in there that you have to kind of learn to deal with. But that is really a, 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 a highly recommended way to kind of, I don't want to say enforce your bullying policy, but to kind of stay on top of it is that a kid maybe can leave something anonymously that their friend Chris is being picked on, or maybe Chris can say, Wayne is picking on me, but again, without signing the name or, or something of that sort, but that, that's one that it says good. And of course, a statement prohibiting retaliation for filing report. You, what it says there is, is Frank, if you get, I mean, you know, uh, Patrick, if you're getting um, accused of bullying, you can't retaliate and go beat Chris. Of course, all you do is you just go to Mike and say, Mike, you know, they're watching you right now, so how about you would take care of Chris for me, and, and that way I won't be out of it. And that happens all the time too. You get some of your friends to start glaring, you know, the, then Kakesh goes get some of those friends to start glaring at uh, John or some of that sort. So anyhow, we'll move to cyberbullying. I think I've even got a, a whole thing on cyberbullying we'll get to in a little while, but a code of conduct that includes cyberbullying even off campus, if you can address that, if to register students or staff maliciously intended with a high likelihood of substantial disruption or creating reasonable fear. The courts, if it goes for has to decide whether it did create reasonable fear. You'll find some courts that said, not enough. Others will say, absolutely. But I would tell you, I do think the courts are swinging more towards realizing that things that happen in the neighborhood that care of the school can have serious consequences and that schools need to have more and more jurisdiction, and particularly with the cyberbullying now. Because many people will say too, you know, uh, and parents too, my child, was at her own house with her own computer and she was expressing an opinion to some of her friends about what she thought of Jonah. She has that right to freedom of speech. But it may be that one of the people who received that lets Jonah know exactly what they're being said and that she feels intimidated. So it just, it's, it, it's a very difficult thing to handle. Davis versus Monroe County Board of Education this back in 1999, so I'm not picking on Metro this time. I'm picking on, uh, 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 Monroe County, which is uh, Forsyth, Georgia, outside of Macon. But uh, it was a fifth grader, a fifth grader now, complained about a student harassing her. The male student attempted to touch female students and made derogatory remarks. That's what this fifth grade student was doing. Well, it was reported to the teacher, because you know kids will go tattle in, in, in fifth grade. The harassment continued and finally it was reported to the principal. Well, there was no punishment ever given to the student and no attempt was made to separate them in class. Mm -hmm. Still, class as normal. And maybe they were sitting very close together and maybe they were just in the same classroom. And I'm not saying that the person did anything. The person may have told the, little, uh, um, the student, I'll say little Johnny, uh, that don't bother little Susie anymore. But you know, nothing was done uh, that was you know, major. Harassment continued throughout the year and it started going with other girls as well. The girl asked to go to the principal, the teacher said no. And the reason why is I'm sure it had been reported she was tired of it and didn't want to hear it anymore and she said no, you're not going to leave my classroom and go to the principal right now. We got work to do. Well, the parent took the school district to court because of deliberate indifference. They, what they basically said was my child is being harassed, sexually, uh, molested 
and you've done nothing about it. And the courts ruled in favor of the parents. And so the moral to the story is that when it happens, you've at least got to make a record of it. You've got to have to show that you've done something. Maybe send Johnny to the counselor. Maybe put Johnny in, ask, in his school suspension one day. You've got to do something to show that you didn't ignore it. It doesn't say you have to solve the world's problems and make Johnny stop. Or let me tell you about if you have a magic wand, sometimes it doesn't work on a kid. But you've got, you can't be indifferent. You can't ignore the problem. You can't be like an ostrich and bury your head in the, in the sand. And sometimes administration may not even know anything about it because the teacher has tried all year to handle it. Or maybe it's that Johnny is EBD. And so maybe that's why we have, you know, I have to do it. Sometimes law enforcement do things that we can't do as a teacher. All right, Franklin versus Gwinnett County School District, 1998. Back when y'all, this was earlier time. A teacher repeatedly sexually abused a student. He would pull her from class and take her into his office at school. Administrators knew about the harassment but failed to take action to stop it. Franklin eventually agreed to resign with the school system if the school system would not prosecute. That's why we have mandated reporters now where they happen because a lot of times back in the uh, 80s and 90s and even earlier, school districts would cut a deal. You resign and we won't pursue it any further. Well, this student took the school district court under Title IX. First time that anybody had ever challenged the sexual harassment under Title IX. And um, the federal court looked at it and said, yeah, you can sue under Title IX, and yeah, you can get money if that's the case, but we're gonna send it back to the district court and let them handle it. We have made our ruling that it is legal to file the complaint under Title IX. And uh, eventually, it will settle out of court for an undisclosed amount of money. But you just need to know that, uh, it, I don't think this will fly these days, but in even 1998, we're probably looking at, probably started about 1993 or so, because it takes you know four or five years for it to get to court, particularly if you go to one court and they rule and send it back down to court and you're negotiating and all that. <coughs> all right. And there's a movement in California, especially that teachers that are sexually involved with students, that students are being rewarded $3 million and more because school officials should have known of illicit affairs and failed to stop. I find that a little bit hard to, to believe, but you know, as I've told you before, California is the, the uh, state with fruits and nuts. And uh, anyhow, on this, what, what the attorneys are doing, they're saying, you have ruined this child's life during the most important years of their life. They now can't go to high school. Finally, you can say, well, they can, but they may say, I don't have anybody to take care of my baby. I've got to drop out of school and take care of the baby. I don't have anybody else to do that. So you, you eventually, you've stopped her from having an opportunity to get an education. She can't go to junior, senior prom. She can't participate in graduation. She can't go to college. She can't prepare herself for a better life. And it's all because you allowed a teacher to have sex with a minor. And they are winning, in some cases, $3 million because the, the, it, over a lifetime you might be able to figure that if I got a job, uh, if I got a, a, a college degree, that you know how much better my life would have been. So it is important that you do report things when you suspect it. If you see little Susie hanging out with a teacher every day in the same room and the door's locked and the light's out or, or the shade's strong, you might want to kind of question that and at least say some proof about it. Hey, I don't know what's going on in Miss Allen's class, but it sure seems suspicious that little Susan in there every day after school, he must be teaching anatomy. Then he, All right, the next law we have is suicide prevention. And, and I think it's good, we need to be trained, but just because you have a law that trains you in suicide prevention doesn't mean that kids aren't going to you know, uh, commit suicide. But hopefully if you've got some training, you may recognize some of the symptoms. So we do have uh, where the law says you must adopt a policy of prevention, intervention, and post-intervention. 
and to provide training as approved by the State Board of Education for all certified employees, not just for guidance counselors, but everybody that's certified should have some type of training on suicide prevention. Now, without trying to incriminate school districts, is there anybody that wants to kind of raise their hand a little bit and say they didn't get trained? Good, okay. Everybody's following the law. That's good to know. All right. Now, student health survey, I've added this to the slides. I'm not so sure some of that that's um, uh, in, in the uh, canvas because I just kind of added this this week. Uh, but 13.3% have considered suicide. And this is the um, survey that the State Department sends out to students every year in grades 6 through 12. 19% have considered self-harm. One out of every five students have considered self-harm. 15 don't feel connected to their classmates, 15%. 21% don't believe they fit in. 23% don't have an adult to talk with at school. 25, or almost 26% are concerned about school safety. And 54% don't take pride in their school. That would probably surprise me as much as anything for me to hear that half the students don't take pride in their school. Now, I'm not saying that every student was honest, but I'm sure there were some that were probably dishonest one way and some were dishonest another way. But it's certainly something that, that makes me have a concern that we as teachers need to make sure our kids feel welcomed. And I've had people tell me, even now teachers, that say when they were in school, particularly those that were very uh, mobile and, and would maybe end up in three or four different schools in the same year of how some teachers almost hated to have them because you well know if kids are moving from school to school in the same year and their attendance is, is sporadic, they're not going to perform as well and, and it makes you look bad as a teacher when they don't perform and it's amazing that some of these kids can be successful but anyhow, um, the South Survey convenient. 8.5% received threatening uh, harassment of uh, uh, text messages, and I'm surprised that's not higher. 9.9 .9 with the target of online bullying, and 17% were victims of bullying or threats. 22 23% reported victimization by rumors or teasing, and 33% were picked on or teased at school. And then continue on, 47% have family problems. And folks, we don't have them but about seven hours a day and they're with their families a lot more than that, and I, I'm surprised it's not higher because there's a lot of family problems. 32% peer problems, 31% school performance problems. I believe that too because we have some kids that don't do their homework, they're not uh, engaged, you know what you do. 30% uh, feel pressure on the demands of school, and so that just kind of gives you why we're still concerned about it. And I'm gonna tell you that probably the next big issue we're gonna have is mental health. It's coming to a time where we're gonna to have to have mental health counselors in the schools. We've got to provide more mental health counselors for adults before they go off and, and, and go on a tangent and do something. And I, I don't know how we can fix every problem, but it's obvious that we as a nation need to do more about poverty and we need to do more about mental health issues. Those are two that we really don't address very well and we really need to try to uh, do a better job with that. Sexual orientation, uh, just a couple of cases, L.W. versus Thomas River, this is in 2005, uh, OCR, which is Office of Civil Rights, and the federal courts upheld the fact that the school failed to protect the students from continued harassment based on sexual uh, orientation. When we talk about sexual harassment, I think in the next uh, PowerPoint, uh, we're going to find out that students with disabilities are probably some of the ones that are picked on the worst and then also those that have maybe gender issues also seem to be bullied more and sometimes schools don't address the problem and uh, so we just need to be conscious of that because right now every student is important. If they go to school it's our responsibility. The Bosley versus Bud Lesney, 1996, school officials did not abide by the anti-harassment policy. Although they had policies in place and did little or no action was taken to discipline the offending students or protect the students who were being uh, subject to harassment. 
And then uh, we have another cyberbullying is sending a posting harmful or cruel text messages. School districts must prove the students' off-campus behavior is truly a threat or create substantial disruption. And we give an example of that where the threats didn't rise to the level. If you want to, you know, research that case. Like I said, I do think the courts are moving more now towards working with the schools on that. But there are still some times when the courts will decide it doesn't rise to the level where you, ha you know, uh, are, are able to punish a kid for something they did off campus. Kowalski versus Berkeley County. MySpace account largely dedicated to the ridicule of the student with sufficient disruption of the school environment. GG versus Gloucester, April 2016. ACLU filed a lawsuit against the school district for adopting a discriminatory bathroom policy that segregated a transgender student from his peers in the Fourth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. This was a huge issue and still is in, in, in uh, not only in the courts but in the, the uh, states, but particularly in the Bible Belt. Uh, where we have, have issues. But what had happened here, the high school student was born a female, but identifies as a male. And this was in Virginia. And the policy required him to use an alternative private restroom facility. Now, this is after parents found out about it. When he first, when the parents first came to the school and told them about that, they allowed him, Gigi, to use the boys' restroom. But like anything, when parents get involved and they don't like something, they raise sand and they complain, then the use comes and gets involved and blah, blah, this, that, and the other. And so the board initiated a policy and they said, no, we'll provide a private restroom for you because you have that transgender concern. And uh, so they filed a lawsuit under the 14th Amendment and Title IX. And uh, as I told you at the beginning of the sophomore year, when the parents uh, told him about his severe gender dysphoria, and he used the Russian for two months without any incident, and when the parents found out about it, the board voted by 6 1, uh, despite warnings from ACLU that they were going to sue if they didn't allow him to use the boys' restroom. Of course, you're just like with white candy. You know, sometimes the board feels like, I've got to do what my community wants to be done. And uh, in a 2-1 decision in the uh, court in Virginia, they ruled in favor of the students. There was a, a three-panel judge and said it was correct. And then at that time, um, the federal courts said, okay, we've had a ruling. And then they sent out that uh, Dear Colleague letter that started telling schools, if you've got a transgender student, they are allowed to use the restroom of their gender. And Texas, in, in fact, one high school principal said, I don't care what, what the, the federal courts say, we will not do that in our school. Several states, North Carolina, uh, Texas, Band, band together and filed a lawsuit uh, regarding this, even though the federal government had already made the de decision that this is how schools will happen. Well, uh, then when Obama got out of, of office and a new group came in, they've kind of pulled that back. So we don't really have any guidance right now. It's kind of hanging in the lurch on, on how we can do that. And uh, again, I, you know, I'll tell you that's probably one of the bigger problems we have now. I, I don't know, what do you do if you have a, a student that, well, he says, well, you know, I'm kind of, um, two days a week I feel like a male, two days a week I feel like a female. I don't know what's going to happen the, the fifth day when I wake up. You go allow them to use the men's restroom two days, the girls' restroom two days, and restroom of choice the other day. I mean, I don't know, but I mean, that could theoretically happen. I really think when people start building schools now, they can start building individual uh, restrooms, kind of like the faculty lounge. But it's going to be like that, and then kids just go in, and it'll be a unisex, but it's just a one stall uh, thing that I think you'll start seeing, particularly if this becomes more prevalent. And, you know, while I believe that we need to work with students who are gender challenged, we also have to have concern about others. And I'm going to tell you what, it doesn't sit well with parents. If I, I'm not so sure I'd want um, 
a male who now decides that they're female to go into my daughter's, I mean, Rock. the rest of my daughter used to. <coughs> yeah, and so anyhow, uh, it's still to be determined and I'm not going to, I'm not an expert, I'm not an attorney, I'm just saying I think that's a big issue and I, I don't have a solution for that. And like I said, six states did argue and uh, it is been, and Fannin County, right after this was done, uh, Fannin County ha had to deal with that issue. And they made the decision, they still made the decision to Gigi that that student could use the restroom that they felt, quote, most comfortable in. And I believe there's several schools right now that are dealing with issues. I think I've, I've heard of several that are experiencing this. All right, Flores versus Morgan. Several students claimed harassment over a seven year period by students because they were perceived to be lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And they were subjected to verbal slurs and notes stuffed in their lockers and physical beatings. And together those students were awarded $1.1 million for the school district failing to take action. All right, security cameras. Video surveillance is permissible where an expectation of privacy is minimal. Hallways, parking lots, playgrounds. Let me ask you this, are there cameras out on I-85? Absolutely, because every morning if you're speeding or you cross the lane, they're going to take a picture and then you're going to get a little uh, present, uh, correct? Uh, are there cameras now at some of the malls? We are really beginning to have a society in which we don't have any privacy per se, and I do think it is a deterrent uh, for, for crime and so on. Yes, Kakeisha. You know, actually I saw the news probably a week ago that Atlanta had, is the number one city in the United States that has more cameras after China. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I, surprised. I, I did. I, don't, I, I may have seen the same thing. I don't think I called that they were the highest, but mm -hmm. I do know that they, and they were, can show statistics where when they put cameras in there, the crime rate mm -hmm. did go down. Now, so we had uh, uh, Brandon versus Overton County School Board in 2008. They decided to put cameras in the locker rooms. Oh, Lord. Now, folks, that's not very bright. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, each of the students was awarded $40,000. Wow. That was a pretty costly decision, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And um, it is legal to use videotapes as evidence. I mean, it, that, the, the law will allow that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why you can be charged a ticket for speeding on I-85. Now, let me ask you another question. Is it legal? for me to secretly audio tape a conversation that Patrick and I are having and him not knowing about it. I think so. We've already heard Patrick's opinion. I'm going to say no. When you disagree with Patrick, you said he didn't know what he's talking about? I'm going to say it depends. Well, oh, you're going to take the easy, you're going to take the attorney's way out, right? I think you have to notify them that you're going to be recorded. Yeah, you have to notify anybody else. The law in Georgia, as long as one person knows that it's being taped it is legal so if i know that i'm taping patrick of course you do then it's legal y'all remember when um casey cagle was running for governor and they had that blurb about him talking about a bill that he knew was bad but you know needed to do that was where it was taped to his conversation one person knew about it so all right now we really have gotten concerned about privacy issues, and I, th I think I saw in the news the other day where the people, hackers are still going into government records and city, and, and they're being able to hack in there, and then they're holding the school, I mean not the school, the, the government agency uh, hostage and having to pay money to get released and all that. And so there's a big effort now, people worrying about the Internet Protection Act, and so that was passed in 2001. Schools must have internet blocking or filtering. Now, that's all it says. It doesn't say how good it has to be. Let me tell you what. Kids can figure out ways to get around that. Adults can too, for that matter. And I don't care how great a system you have, somebody's going to be able to figure out a way to get around it. So, but you are required to have some type of internet blocking. So, you also have internet use agreements uh, where it should be signed by employees and students. How many of you signed something at the beginning of the year saying you know that you're supposed to use your laptop computer? for business purposes, right? Uh -huh. Students the same way. They sign knowing saying that if I'm using it, I have, I have to abide by the school rules and regulations. 
And then 20-2-677, you have to adopt the local policy on student data privacy. You have to designate a privacy officer. I don't know who it is in Gwinnett, but even the State Department of Education has to have somebody that is designated as their privacy officer. Mainly, it is you know, somebody in IT, I would, I would think. And you have to develop a complaint procedure in case somebody wants to file a complaint about uh, student data privacy issues. And you also have to ensure vendors are in compliance with the new law, because vendors now have to be sure that they're meeting all the student data uh, requirements as well. And the State Department of Education must employ a state officer in charge of data privacy. I don't know who it is for the State Department. If one of you wants to get excited and Google it and find out, that's fine with me, but you know, they're supposed to have one. All right. Of course, medicine has another big issue, right? Because 20-2-776.3, policy must be adopted if you wish to provide inhalers. I mean, my gosh, look at all, look at all the things we got now with people inhaling. I mean, the, you know, I, I, can't, I can't figure out why it's legal, but it, it certainly is. And then you can stockpile prescriptions. So if you've got somebody that needs medical marijuana, they can bring your year of supply to your school and you've got to store it for them. Boy, again, if you have four or five of them under that, I mean, you might have somebody want to break in and, and, and do that. But you can stockpile the prescriptions now. And then 16-12-191, uh, policy adopted for students with prescription pursuant to the new state law for medical marijuana. And of course, and then they expanded that this past year with even more. In fact, you can start growing it now in some places uh, for medical, medicinal purposes, right? Okay. And then requirements for reporting has changed for school districts and defects that you need to know about. That is school safety, okay? Any questions on that? All right, sexual harassment. And we talked about it a little bit. Definition of behavioral is unwanted sexual or gender-based behavior that occurs when one person has formal or informal power over another. Behavior may be verbal or nonverbal or physical and legal violation, violation of individual's legal rights. Now what I mean by me having authority over a person, if I'm the principal, then would I have authority over a teacher? Yes. And so maybe I'll start maybe harassing that teacher by making some catty comments or kind of hinting, hey, if you want to teach the bluebirds instead of the buzzards, maybe you need to <laughs> start uh, come, maybe coming with me and we can go out to dinner or we can go maybe we visit to the motel, motel, or whatever. But anyhow, uh, we mentioned the two types of sexual harassment. We're pro pro just for that. It's an implicit or explicit request for sexual favors that may be used as a condition or <coughs> place for education and seizure and advancement. You want to be that assistant principal? You need to come with me and be with me for a while. I need to get to know you on a more personal level before I want you to be the assistant principal. Or do you really want that last hour be your planning period? We can probably work that out. Come to the office uh, tonight about 6 o'clock. Let's discuss it, okay? All right. And then the hostile environment is unwelcome sexual remarks, touching, but it usually is required to be repetitive or pervasive. I was talking about that earlier and said that you really need to let somebody know because if you're laughing with it and all that, then they're not going to realize that you've been offended. So you really need to make sure that you say something to let them know that you're offended by that. Then once you put them on notice, then that makes it a lot uh, easier. Now, there are sometimes a first time offender that can be a hostile environment. You know, if you're grabbing somebody and, and all that, uh, you know, that's, that's probably enough for the first time. All right, so who gets harassed most often? Now, don't everybody raise your hand and say me. Anybody want to know who? Women. Women. Females in non-traditional roles. Well, we have a lot of them. Uh, women in graduate school. Now, I really think it's more the ones that are full-time graduate students than the ones that are just here, that, uh, for that, but I don't know that because I've really not read in the best case of research, but I do know that women in graduate school uh, are harassed more often than women that are not. Women and girls of color. Young, inexperienced, unassertive, socially isolated males and females. We see that all the time with people that are shy, they're intimidated, they're too scared to do anything, and somebody will kind of take them under their wings and, and uh, you know, lesbians, gays. We talked about that, that, that this type of people, and we talked about lawsuits where uh, they're getting money for that. Persons with disabilities. Persons temporarily vulnerable due to a life crisis. 
maybe the spouse dies. How many times do you have people start coming over and trying to spend time with them, particularly if they're rich, and trying to get some of their money and things like that sort while they're still under pressure, not thinking and spending time? So we do have that. Young teachers at the college or high school level, and we've had to deal with, with student teachers who their supervising teacher has kind of, um, how shall I say it, uh, been unprofessional in their relationship with them. Female students who work in dormitories as resident advisors. Students and others who work in low-level jobs. Now let's face it, if you have a low-level job, then you probably are not overly educated, so you probably don't know your rights and all the laws. But number two, you very much need to keep your job because you've got to have some income. I mean, you're struggling as is to pay bills, but if you don't have a job, it's even worse. So I think that people that have a little, they may tolerate more because they need the job worse. And persons who have been sexually assaulted or, or abused, that includes incest. If it's always happened to you, you don't know anything better or, or you think it's normal, then why should you report it? Because you've dealt with it all your life from age five until 25. And persons with economic disadvantage would go along the same way with, with low-level jobs because you know they kind of go hand in hand. And then persons who are single or divorced. Because when you get a divorce, it's traumatic and then uh, people want to try to take advantage of that. A couple of statistics. 85% of girls and 76% of the boys report experiencing sexual harassment while attending public schools. A lot higher than what that mental health survey showed. 18% of reporting students were victimized by a teacher or another adult. One out of every five. 79% of harassed students have been victims of harassment by other students. And that's particularly middle school. 47% of harassed students say they were harassed between the sixth and seventh grades. It may be lower than that now. Major effects of sexual harassment. Educational, not wanting to go to school, not wanting to talk as much in class, finding it hard to pay attention in class. It, when, you, when you feel threatened, when you feel abused, it's hard to concentrate on school because you've got all the things that you're worried about. And so we certainly understand the, the, that being a problem. And if you ever have a child or a, a student in your class that seems to start withdrawing or not participating or start missing class, you might want to kind of try to find out what's going on if you have a good relationship with that student. Emotional. Sometimes they feel embarrassed, they feel self-conscious, less confident, afraid. Sometimes they're afraid to say anything because they don't want to um, lose their peers and friends and they're trying to fit in and so they're willing to kind of put up with some of the abuse because they don't want other people to hate them as well. In behavioral, avoiding the person who harassed you, staying away from particular places and school, changing seats. There's been kids that have actually taken the long way around to get to the next class just to avoid a group that maybe hangs out at a particular place. Examples of harassment, if unwelcomed, direct or indirect threats or bribes, sexual innu innuendos and comments, sexually suggestive sounds, gestures, thrusts, winks, touching, patting, pinching, stroking, squeezing, tickling, or brushing up against, oogling, leering, staring, name calling, Displays of material with sexually explicit or graphic content, dirty jokes, actual attempted sexual assault, uh, or attempted sexual assault, and then we have mooning. Anybody know what that is? Oh yeah. Streaking. <laughs> sharking. Well, there's so many things sharking now that you could do. Anybody know what sharking is? Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. That's when you kind of go under the water. But you're not in the border. You stick it and you take and jerk somebody's uh, shorts oh. down or something like that. That's sharking. Spiking. You don't yeah. live in the real world, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie to a fool. In other words, you're trying to claim you love them just to do, get something off of them and you're just using them. That's what the spiking is. It's, it's kind of like you know, you're spiking a drink to take advantage of them and you're telling them lies and making them believe things so that you can take advantage of them. All right, shouting at Sandy's, name calling, joking, creating a sexually demeaning atmosphere, flipping up skirts, 
In fact, you know, we have a law where it's called upskirting when you try to take a picture of that. And we actually had a teacher that tried to, he, he was a math teacher. And he would call students up to his desk, those girls that were wearing skirts, to let them work a problem at his desk. And he would act like he was, um, you know, what, and he, the whole time he had his camera taking pictures. And what we have, and, and of course just the other day, a teacher in Gwinnett followed a student to a dressing room, right? And had been stalking the student for a week or so. Do y'all see that in the news? No. I know y'all were studying the school law. That explains it. He followed the kid at the mall. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And I understand now that he'd he been stalking the, the student the for for a while, kind of trying to, you know. He uh, followed him in the dressing room and a bathroom. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Such yes. 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 Anyway, yes. the kid ran away. Mm -hmm. Had video camera. Teasing about sexuality, breasts or genitals, whistling or writing. Oh, there's there was a seven. There's a nine. I mean, we've all done some of well, since we all have done some of it. It's been done. Somebody has. And telling someone what behaviors they would like to engage in. We have that in texting a lot of times. That uh, the you know, people will text uh, somebody and, and tell them what they would really like. And then touching and grabbing. Persistent unwanted sexual attention or stalking. Stalking is, is something that uh, you'd be amazed that's done. That's probably done more by adults than by the students. Yeah. And graffiti about a person's sexuality. You can walk to some restrooms, uh, a gas station, call so and so for a good time, and you know, all types of things like that, all right? And so, handling the problem of sexuality, how do you handle it? I mean, because would you consider it being serious? Absolutely. Well, first of all, you need to publicize the policy. All employees and students, letting people know we're not going to put up with sexual harassment. We, we prohibit sexual harassment. We have a safe environment at school. You gotta sensitize and train students, teachers, and staff to recognize reported harassment. You just can't talk, you gotta train the people to look. You've gotta be able to look and, and notice if students have a different demeanor and things. But we need to constantly do that uh, if you're gonna have a safe environment. Establish complaint procedure. Everybody should know what they should have. In fact, you should even have an opportunity for them to do it anonymously. You've got to take the report seriously. It's just like this. If if there's a, if I get a phone call about a bomb threat, and it's a 13-year-old voice, I probably don't think there's a bomb in the school, but unfortunately, I probably need to have to take that seriously and evacuate the school and let the bomb people come in and do that. Now, back before the war, when I was administrator a long time ago, when we didn't worry about that stuff, and I got a phone call like that, I'd thank the person, I'd stay in the school, and we wouldn't evacuate, and I figured, well, if it was true, I'd get blown up with the rest of them, and then we'd have to worry, you know, they wouldn't have to face consequences. But nowadays, I'm gonna tell you, now that I've had a little more experience, I would tell you, if you get a bomb threat, you better take it seriously. If you get a student that has a dream, you better take it seriously. <laughs> Investigate all claims promptly and thoroughly, and respond to concerns, and you gotta document. Now, if <coughs> Megan comes to me, and um, I'm, I'm sorry, if Rebecca comes to me and says that Wayne is harassing her, but she doesn't want me to do anything about it right now because she thinks she can handle it, but she kinda just wanna let me know, do I say, okay, well, I understand, Rebecca, we just won't worry about it. Yeah. If she makes that complaint, I've got to tell her, Rebecca, you made a complaint, and I've got to investigate because I'm legally required to. And then you got to follow up on all complaints. You can't just ignore them like an ostrich and put your head in the sand. Take appropriate steps to resolve complaints and including disciplinary action. There's nothing wrong with going back to Rebecca in a couple days and say, Rebecca, has the problem been solved? Or a little Susie. Susie, do you still feel like you're being bullied? If she says yes, then you probably need to find out a little bit more about it and document and do some more checking. Dangerous words? You don't say, oh, it's just teasing. You don't need to worry about it. Just ignore it. If you just ignore them, they'll get tired and they'll stop them. You need to learn how to handle these things. It's your fault. Look at the way you dress. You're inviting them to, to make comments. I know he didn't mean it like that. I, 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 know. I, I know Patrick, he wouldn't do that. It's all part of growing up. Just grow up. Learn how to deal with it. And never promise absolute confidentiality. I talked about that soccer coach that 
you know, the player came and talked about uh, being sexually abused. So if a kid wants to come and talk to you about something, you can't promise them absolute confidentiality. You say, I will try to keep it confident, but there's some things that by law I'm required to report. All right, any questions on that? Okay, we're going to, we've talked a little bit about cyberbullying when we talked about school safety, but I kind of want to put a little emphasis on this because it is really getting more serious. And we really, I think, don't do a very good job of teaching kids the importance of proper use of technology because they don't think about just hitting the button and all of a sudden it's too late to bring it back because it's already been sent out. So we really need to work on that. And here I am, I can even spell technology and yet I'm trying to tell y'all that we really need to do a little bit more about cyberbullying. But um, students can't learn in an unsafe environment. I will tell you that right now. It's very difficult when a good student does not feel safe at school. So you must set clear behavioral expectations. Kids need to know what's expected of them. I found that when you have expectations of kids, most of them will go rise to that challenge, particularly if you're consistent about that and you stay focused on that. They know what's important in your class and what's not after a couple of days of routine because they know what they can get away with and what they can't, or at least they will try it and find out. And it's all about caring. You've got to have that relationship with students, but it's got to be a professional relationship where they feel comfortable with you being the adult, you being the teacher, you being the supervisor, but them knowing that you care about them, if they've got a problem, that they can't approach you because they've got to have an adult at school that they can trust. Emphasize appropriate uses of social media and uh, what the student's view is, it is their world and not yours. And you know what? I guarantee you that in many households, the students know a lot more about technology or what to hide uh, from their parents because the parents are not actively engaged. Many times there's parents that are working, both of them have demanding jobs, and they, get on, and they don't have time to keep up with what Susie and Billy are doing. And uh, so, you know, really, I think that a lot of kids are pretty street smart. And, and Megan, I believe you said that you don't allow your kids to use Snapchat. How do you know they're not using it, though? Well, it's not on their phone. Okay. So but you, so you know. I can't that. say they never, but yeah, look at other people, but they don't have the app. Okay. And I understand there are some now that you can hide mm -hmm. certain apps on your phone. So, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to find it, but you know, yeah, that's, that's theirs. And what they'll say, they know more right. than us. And they're probably right. They know it's not right to cyberbully, but they really don't care. I mean, that, you know, they're 13, 14, 15 years old. They don't, they don't really care about it. They don't really think about the repercussions. Most of what they do is not thoughtful, but rather spontaneous. You got a little Johnny, y'all want to claim he's ADD. He's very spontaneous on everything. Well, we got a lot of teenagers that are very <laughs> spontaneous, I can tell you that. Social media just requires a swipe or hit the button. It's a heck of a lot easier than me going up with my fist and threatening somebody. It's a lot easier to do it by hitting the button. Mobile devices are the most common means of accessing social media. Whole bunch of kids have this right now. A whole bunch. Even the ones on free and reduced lunch. In fact, I can remember back a long time ago when you had the Atari and all the games and we didn't have it for our children. And my daughter came home one day and said, even the kids on free lunch have it, and I don't have it, you know. So, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, they can have email, Facebook. They don't use it anymore. They start out, but what is, somebody said, well, it's 14 years old now, Facebook, something like that. But I don't have any years, but anyhow, the kids don't use that anymore. The old people are using Facebook. Instagram, Snapchat, the evil one, YouTube, yeah. In fact, I think YouTube is probably one of the more popular ones I have. Of course, Twitter, uh, Tumblr, Vine, WhatsApp, and there's a lot more. I mean, that's come up since that, and I'm just not familiar with all of them. 98% of the youth reported to use the security settings. 31% of the youth reported being cyberbullied online within the past month. 50% under the age of 15 reported being bullied within the past month. It's amazing that I can show these statistics, and every one of them is different depending on you know who's conducted it. 41% of the youth said they would not report online abuse. Why would they report online abuse? 
Exactly. That's that's one of the reasons kids won't report it because number one, they're afraid you'll take the advice, the, their device away from them to solve the problem, or you'll go and see where they've been mm -hmm. on their their phone uh, or on the computer. So they don't want you to know where all they've been either. And some teens report being online more than five hours a day. Five hours. 88% send approximately 30 to 40 texts per day. And girls totally dominate social media. Boys use video games. So when they have spend the night parties, the boys are playing video games, the girls are busy you know, sending emails and texts and all this stuff to the kids. When they get tired of the video games, then the boys, they get the boys' attention then. And half the teens use social media to express romantic interest because it's less disheartening to be rejected over the phone than it is face to face. The Pew study in 2007, 77% of the teens own phones and 91% of these teens use social networking sites such as Facebook and Instagram. 32% of the teens have been online, you know, ignoring online activities. 13 say someone has spread a rumor about them online. 38% of the girls, 26% of the boys have been bullied and cyberbullied in 2012, although it happens daily, it's rarely reported. 10% will tell an adult and 5% uh, of these will, and then one in five of these reported law enforcement, okay? Practice of youth sexually, writing sexually explicit materials, photos of themselves and peers, transmitting video phones, cameras, computers, video games, Guarantee you look at you confiscate some middle school phones, you'd be surprised what you see on. Thirty percent admit they have sent nude pictures via phone phones, and forty-five percent report having received pictures in their phones. Almost half. Willful and uh, repeated harm inflicted through computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices. That's the definition. Cyberbullying is easier to accomplish than traditional bullying for the following reasons. Increased accessibility. You can be anonymous about it. It's violent in nature. It doesn't take but about a minute for it to really go out to more people than you send it to. Uh, you can exclude a child. This, this is one type of cyber. You just exclude them. You just don't respond to their emails. You, you send all your friends and say, let's ignore so and so. You can pretend to be someone else. You can uh, do gossiping and rumors. You can do publishing private info that is embarrassing, such as suggestive or explicit. We've had girls who are mad at other girls going to girls' locker rooms and take pictures when they're changing clothes and send them out. Trickery, getting someone to reveal private information. How many times do we have people that do telephone scams now? And, and, and so if, if we can fall for it, certainly kids can. Flaming, which is hostile and insults and threats. Repeated ongoing offensive messages. Direct threats, repeatedly sending unwanted messages, the difference between cyberbullying and bullying, anonymous, no physical harm, fewer consequences, gives power to those that don't own habit, can see impact of behavior, happens anytime, any setting, victims don't talk about it, you have an infinite audience, rapid dissemination, and it doesn't go away, where in the bullying, you're known to the target, Physical harm is very definite to the uh, possibility. There's maybe a little bit of inhibition. I mean, I'm not so sure I want to be uh, going out there and, and uh, uh, get beat to a pulp. There's well-known consequences if you are bullying somebody because we have that in the handbooks. And the powers through humiliation, social exclusion, uh, damaged reputation. Now, Georgia law we talked about, and we talked about all the things that, that, that it is and the each school must contain provisions that address the campus. And uh, you must balance the need for a safe and effective learning route with the needs for free expression. Because you've got to think about your First Amendment rights, but you've got to think about the safety of kids and the set balancing. Kind of like religion. You know, you got some people who want you to really get religion, some want you to stay away from it. So you've got to balance that. And let me tell you what, when you punish a child, you better believe those parents are going to come to defend their child most of the time because they don't want the child to, to have uh, punishment. And the worst thing you can do now is not suspension, it's called social suspension. They can come to school, but they can't go to any 
uh, basketball game, football game, dance. Now, I don't really get the parents out right now. They don't need to spend them three days in school than to have social uh, um, suspension. But the code of conduct has to address the issues of you know range of of, uh, of consequences. And again, we talked about why students don't tell anyone. They'll lose their phone, and internet privileges. Uh, the student being built man, know who's doing it because it can be done anonymously. They're afraid of repercussions. They're afraid they will not be believed, and they don't want to tell us where they went or what they were doing on the internet. Kind of like when we used to go out in cars. We didn't want parents to know where we went in the car. We tell them we went one place and went somewhere else. <laughs> All right, I can't pronounce this person's name, but she had a Facebook page. This is this is just uh, some real examples of cyberbullying. Someone stole her identity and created a Facebook page with a slightly different name. Sent friend requests to numerous students because you get friend requests all the time with Facebook and that. Once befriended, she started sending sexually explicit comments and profanity laced tirades to these people. It wasn't even the girl that it was pretending to be. She was pretending to be the student. And then once the page was removed, when they found out, another one came up. And she would flirt with men on Facebook, random men. You know how bad that is when you start getting them and having uh, chat rooms with, with adults. She took new pictures of herself from the neck down and posted them, claiming to be the thesis. And police finally were able to track it down, and it was a 15-year-old girl that was doing that to another student. 14-year-old student. He blogged about the bullying he received for being bisexual. He would post inspirational and anti-suicide messages on his social pages. The parents said, boy, he's really handling it well. He thought he was strong and posted didn't bother him. The anonymous post was stupid, fat, gay, ugly. He must die. He finally hung himself. And it's all because of cyberbullying. And yet, because he tried to put on a good face about that, parents and others thought he was handling it when it was tearing him up on the inside. Kowalski versus Berkeley County, we talked a few minutes about that, but uh, a student created a MySpace profile, Sash. She claimed it stood for Students Against Sluts Herpes, but others said it really stood for Students Against Shay's Herpes. There was a student named Shay, and they were bullying her, if you want to, on, on the, the um, uh, on the, the internet. The students invited about 100 students to join, and 24 did. No, just sent out 100, and instantly got 24 to join. And she posted images and comments making fun of Shay. One student picked, uh, posted a picture of Shay and put red dots on her face to simulate herpes, and added a sign near her pelvic region that read, Warning, enter at your own risk. And the second photo that captured her face was a sign that said, excuse me, portrait of a whore. Shay and her parents complained to school officials, <coughs> excuse me, and the administrators considered a hate website that violated school policy. Kowalski was suspended for five days, but given a 90-day social suspension. She sued, claiming it was a violation of her First Amendment rights of free speech, that it took place off the school grounds and the school grounds had no jurisdiction. She did it with her own computer on her own property. The courts ruled in favor of the school system and established the following standard, material of substantial disruption in which the speech makes it way to the school in a meaningful way. In other words, the school was able to show that it was disrupting the school and they were able to deal with that. Another one, uh, in 2010, after school one day, a student recorded another student of friends and then sat in an off-campus restaurant and talked about a classmate and making vulgar derogatory remarks about her. That evening, he posted it on YouTube and then contacted some of the students suggested they view the site. Next, he called the student that they were making fun of and suggested she watch it. The classmates on the advice of her mother said to leave the video up so they could show the school administrators. They didn't want to take it down. The school district suspended the student for two days, demanded that she delete the website, and made her and her friends write about the incident. Subsequently, the student sued, saying her free right to the speech was violated. The court ruled there was no material disruption in that school, and that since the school had blocked access to YouTube, the only students that could do it and see it were those that had cell phones. 
And they say teenagers often say mean-spirited things, and the school should only be concerned with consoling the victim. Now, and that was what, 2010? I do think was swung over, but you can see, well, here's the problem. The courts can never catch up with technology because technology is constantly changing. We know courts, it takes two or three or four, four years for something to happen. By the time that they're dealing with Facebook, their kids have long left you know, Facebook. So that's the problem with that. And we're kind of dealing with a, a blind situation, not knowing what the courts will do. But I do think now with all the suicides and things of that sort, we are getting better about dealing with kids that are cyberbullying off campus. All right. I do have credit at the end. Actually, one of the graduate students did this, and I liked her. I hope one much better than mine. I thought it was better, so I said, hey, I'll just use hers and let her invent the wheel. But uh, she did a great job on sex trafficking, and um, a couple of slides I think are really important. The child sex trafficking industries, we have pimp control, prostitution, pornography, escort service, commercial front brothel, residential brothel, gang-related prostitution, new massages, strip clubs, personal sexual servitude, phone sex lines, uh, familial pimping, internet-based exploitation, private parties, all of that with kids that are under the age that people are dealing with. Let me tell you, in fact, it is so financially, I don't want to use the word rewarding, but uh, lucrative, I think would be a better word to use, that many, I shouldn't say many, some people are actually leaving the drug industry and going into sex trafficking. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, but you say that, and I just remember this guy speaking this year, and he made the comment because he worked for the sex trafficking. He made the comment. He talked to drug dealers. He said, "Why do you do sex trafficking and not sell drugs?" He said, "Because once I sell a bag of cocaine crack a night, it's done. So I can sell a child 13 times over." You're exactly not only that. The the really. There's not a, you can get a lot more trouble for selling drugs mm -hmm. than you can for sex trafficking right now. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to change. The other thing, there are some people that make $30,000 a week sex trafficking. Now, I think teachers don't make quite that much Shit. in a week's time. But, uh, all right. So, let's talk about it in a minute. The average age of a childhood in sex sport is 12. 12 years old. Folks, you would think it would be 16, 15, 12 years old is the average age. That means there's some younger than that. 7,200 men purchase sex with adolescent girls each month in Atlanta. Just in Atlanta. 7,200. Atlanta was named by FBI as one of 14 U.S. cities with the highest rate of children being used in prostitution. And I think they're number one with Hispanic children. One out of four girls and one out of six boys will be sexually victimized by the time they reach the age of 18. Think about the students in your class. Due to STDs, violence, drugs, and suicide, children who are victims of commercial sexual exploitation are considered lucky if they live beyond seven years of that. Labor and sex, sex trafficking profit, $32 billion a year, and um, the sex trafficking alone, $28 billion. According to the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, the federal law in 2000, they passed an act outlining some things that would happen if you're caught sex trafficking. And it, it gives them the term of sex trafficking is recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining a person for the person of commercial service act. We're not going to, you can read that, but I'm going to put it on the canvas. So we're not going to ruin all of the, the law about it, other than the once you know there is a law on the books with, with that now. But what I want you to know is that if you look about two to four hundred dollars of girls are sold online per month. Traffickers make, excuse me, I was off $3,000, $33,000 a week. 91% of the victims in Georgia were enrolled in school at the time of the exportation, 91%. 29% of the men who purchased sex overall are 6,000 men per month in Georgia, specifically directed to seek out sex with young females. 12,400 men each month in Georgia pay for sex with a young female. 7,200 of whom end up exploiting adolescent female. 
These men account for 8,700 paid sex acts with adolescent females, and females are exploited about three times per night, and with an average of 300 acts per day. We talk about the old kids. Men who buy sex with young women, age over 40, 22%, under 30, 34%, and 30 to 39, 44%. Indicators of human sex traffic, if you can look at the academic, the behavioral, the physical, the emotional, the social. Remember, 91% of these kids at somewhere in the public schools when this happened to them. 76 were arrested in an eight state child exploitation explor 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 operation. Remember when the Super Bowl came to Atlanta? They had a stinger because they knew there'd be a lot of sex traffickers out there, and they arrested uh, 34 people. Uh, which were involved in that, and six of the arrested in Georgia traveled for the purpose of meeting and having sex with a minor, and eight were registered sex offenders. And um, what they tell me is that these people can walk out into Atlanta, in the town, and within about 45 seconds, they can pick out which girls are runaways or which ones need help. And a lot of times when they go to this person, they hadn't had a meal or a place to spend the night in the last two days, they can say, hey, you look tired, you look hungry, come on, I'll buy you some deep. You need a place to stay tonight. And pretty soon, they've got, and then they start getting the girls drugs, getting them addicted to that. And so pretty soon, the girls, uh, you know, they've got to stay with them because they're addicted and they're, they're, they're supplying. But not only that, unfortunately, sometimes these girls have a better life with the sex trafficker than they did at their own home because they've got clothes to wear, they've got food. They got you know, other things too. Of course, now they give up some things as well. But it's you know when you talk about a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, you know. All right, and then that, that back that just kind of gives you an example of them. We didn't post their pictures, but um, sure. and then Georgia's anti-sex traffic lobbying uh, is an annual event on February the 20th. It's for people to talk about these issues, and we are getting more and more notice about that, that we do begin to realize it is something that's very serious, and those are the references. All right, and Megan Brockington, who's a Gwinnett teacher, was the one that really prepared this, and I just used most of her information.